transition in this service and we want to welcome you to the first altar that we're hosting here in the Charlotte region. We want to thank you and welcome you if you're joining us online from around the nation. Welcome to the altar and thank you for joining us online tonight. Uh, the altar exists to partner with local churches to prepare the bride of Christ for the wedding day, to prepare the heart of the bride of Christ to say I do to her bridegroom King Jesus. And often people hear the name or the word altar and they're thinking about contests with the, pro the false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, but we're talking about a wedding altar. We're talking about the place where we deliver our vows to our bridegroom, King Jesus. And I've often said before that nobody should be indifferent going into their wedding day. The return of the Lord is not something we approach with apathy, complacency, or indifference about, eh, it's okay whether it happens or it doesn't happen. We long for Jesus. We want to be wounded with love sickness, so addicted to his presence that we're not okay if he's not here, not bodily present with us. We want more than revival. We want revival that's unto the return of the Lord and the establishment of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's our cry. It's the ancient Maranatha cry. Before that word ever showed up in scriptures, there was this cry for God's rule and God's reign to be established on earth as it is in heaven. We want to tap into that ancient well tonight. We want to tap into that prayer of the prophets tonight. And we want to invite the Lord into this place through our worship, through our intercession and preparing our hearts as we've already been preparing the atmosphere. But we want to thank you again uh, for coming out from whatever church, local church you might be joining us from. Welcome. And we want to encourage you as we begin in worship here in the next couple moments to feel free to move out from your seat, to make your way down to the front, find a spot. It's a free and open environment. And we want you to uh, feel encouraged to come out from where you are and join us in worship. Father, tonight, we pray that you would unveil the glory of your son. We pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to rest on your people that we might grow in the knowledge of God. Father, we pray that you would take us up higher tonight. Take us above all the distraction, all the temptations, all the warfare tonight. Take us into the beauty realm tonight. Help us to gaze on the one seated on the throne. We want to lock eyes with you, Jesus. We want the fire that's in your eyes to get in our hearts. So Jesus, we give you this night as a love offering. Tonight, Lord, may you wound us with love sickness and make us long and ache for your return. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Go after the Lord with one mind, one heart. Come on, let's get to the front. Let's, let, let's just not wait. Let's get hungry. Let's come to the altar and let's go after the Lord together. Jesus, we're hungry. 
celebration of joining of the bride and the sun, the two becoming one. Oh, the prophecies fulfilled in a moment, so we sing like the.
Cause you've proven yourself to show up If we wait, I don't want to be asleep Till you come, I don't want to miss it When you show up So cover us with oil And cover me with oil Set me on fire So I'm awake when you come So I'm awake when you come Cover me with oil Set me on fire So I'm awake when you come So I'm awake when you come And cover me with oil Set me on fire So I'm awake when you come So I'm awake when you come The Spirit and the Bride Oh, the Spirit and the Bride say come And glory be to the righteous one We'll sing this song until you come And glory be to the righteous one
you to close your eyes close your eyes all across this place if you're married and you're a husband I want you to think about the way that you propose to your wife the planning the cost the preparation the intentionality that went into that one moment if you're a wife whether newly married or you've been married for some time I want you to remember what that day what that moment felt like if you're not married in this room and maybe that day feels far off, I want you to imagine, whether male or female, what you always hoped or imagined that moment might be like. Once you've got that fixed in your mind, let me bring you into a better love story. Before the first divine display of creative power, before God spoke and the universe was formed, before there was a single galaxy or he hung the first star, before there was sun or moon or the Milky Way galaxy, before there was rivers and streams, lakes and oceans, before there was mountains and valleys, creatures crawling across the earth or in the sky or the waters or before he made man in his own image. The Bible says that he predestined, he decided in advance. There was already a decision for the cross in his heart. And unlike that beautiful love story you pictured in your mind at the fancy restaurant or under the Eiffel Tower, our bridegroom king marched to Calvary. 39 lashes cut across his back. Warring through the night, surrendering before he ever made the decision. Blood dripping from his face, his face bloodied and bruised. 
a man of no reputation. He hung on the cross naked and exposed. He suffered verbal abuse and rejection even from his closest friends. As he slid the ring on his bride's finger, a covenant people, and he said, will you marry me? We love to talk about the bridal paradigm because we love the idea of reigning and ruling beside Jesus in the age to come. And men, if this concept of being a bride and even the wedding dress on the stage makes it hard for you to step into that reality, let me bring you into Mark 10 where the sons of Zebedee, called the sons of thunder, approach Jesus with an audacious request to rule and reign, to have the seats of authority on his left and on his right. This is often the bridal paradigm we step into. We like that part. But Jesus asked a question. He says, are you able to drink from this bitter cup of suffering or share in my baptism? And they said, yes, we are. And he said, indeed you shall. He was redefining for them what greatness looked like, but what it looked like to partake in him. All through the New Testament, we see we're co-heirs if we're co-crucified. To deliver our wedding vows to Jesus is to give our, say yes to his surrender terms. And you see what kind of radical love it evoked in the early New Testament church. We're in the engagement period, friends. I think about after I proposed to my wife, if she had said, well, we're not married yet, and she got caught up in other lovers, and she started flirting around and going on dates with other men, because she said the wedding day is too far off. Or I asked her, hey, are you okay? You know, we might have to move the wedding back. And, and she, she's totally just indifferent about it. And it doesn't cause her any ache or pain. It just doesn't really matter if it happens or not. Is there a bride in the earth today who is wounded with love sickness? who has seen the cross as the engagement ring on her finger. And when she sees the cross, she remembers that there's a day coming that demands her total loyalty, her total fidelity, her wholehearted and burning affection so that Jesus on his wedding day will not be standing next to a bride with a glazed over look on her face or scanning the room for other lovers. Will Jesus have a wholehearted bride? So we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Come on, would you just say that to him? It's the the word on the lips of the bride at the end of the age. Would you just let that rise from your heart all over the room? Even so, come Lord Jesus, no matter what it might cost, no matter what it might look like, come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Come on, out of your own mouth, if that desire's not there in your heart, ask for it. Lord Jesus, come. Let that wound you. Jesus, come. Even so, come. Let it go deep. Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come. Lord Jesus, come. Oh, even so, come. Lord Jesus. So, Father, we pray that you would wound us with love sickness for the return of your Son. We ask that you would 
peel back our eyes just a little bit further. Allow us to see more of your glory, more of your beauty. Search us and know us with your fiery gaze tonight. Walk amongst us. Son of glory, wound us with love sickness. Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus. And everybody said, amen. You can go ahead and head back to your seat. If you came in late, we want to thank you once again for joining us for the very first altar service hosted here at The Refuge. But the altar exists to partner with local churches to prepare the bride for the wedding day, to make her heart tender and prepare her to say, I do, to her bridegroom, King Jesus, to invite the bride into this eternal storyline and into God's end time narrative as that being normative, as that being the natural desire of a bride waiting for her wedding day. I love the way that Samuel Whitfield says it. Have you ever talked to an engaged woman before? You can ask her about anything and she'll respond by telling you something about her wedding day. You, know, you could talk about the weather and somehow she's getting back to her wedding day. It's where her gaze is constantly, her focus is constantly on that day. I wanna let you know that uh, you can join us again next month. Each of these services will be hosted on the last Friday of the month. We'll have Catherine Mullins in the house leading worship next month, who's a friend of The Refuge, has been here before. So go ahead and mark your calendar for February and March for the last Friday of the month for the altar services. They'll be streamed online again. So if you're joining us online, maybe mark your calendar, make a weekend trip out of it. We would love to have you. And if you really get marked and you really start to get wounded uh, with this love sickness that we're talking about, the end time message, you want to go further in that and the Fridays aren't just aren't enough for you. Starting in August, we're going to be launching the Maranatha School of Ministry. Uh, it was previously in Lakeland, but it's going to be moving up here to Charlotte starting in August. And a lot of times you hear ministry school, and if you're over about 25, you just check out, right? You think that's for the young adults who can quit their jobs and live together with like eight people in an apartment for a year. Uh, but really, this is available to anybody. Um, so there's going to be an in-person offering, and there's also going to be an online offering. It'll be Tuesday and Thursday nights. So it'll be an evening thing and we're still working out some of the details of what that's actually going to look like. But this, of course, is for those who feel called to vocational ministry, whether in the fivefold, an apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor. But it's also for moms and dads, for grandmothers and grandfathers, for school teachers, because we believe that in the end times, people are going to be looking for people who have sound biblical understanding of what's going on all around them. It's going to be the five or six year old at the dinner table looking to mom saying, you've been following Jesus for 40 years. What's going on? And being able to point to the Bible and tell them what's going on. So if you feel this end time messenger calling, this might be for you. Again, there's an online offering and then there's going to be in-person training again on Tuesday, Thursday nights. The in-person group will be helping us out with these altar services on the Friday nights and then doing some outreaches, street preaching outside the abortion clinics, doing different things in the community to let the rubber hit the road. Uh, if you're watching online, stay tuned. JeremiahJohnson.tv, the website, will have more information coming out uh, in the coming weeks and months. But again, this end time message, you know, as we prepare for that day, there's two ditches we have to be careful that we don't fall into. And the first one is indifference. And that's where we just get in a place where we say, you know, the smart people can't even figure it out and they're all disagreeing with each other and it's all gonna work out anyway, so I'm just not gonna pay attention. But when we put it back in the light of the wedding day, what bride can be indifferent about the wedding day? Indifference and apathy and complacency isn't an option. But we have to be careful that we don't fall into the opposite ditch either, which is sensationalism, where we make everything hysterical. And every time something funky or weird is trending in the news, we fit it into some end time scheme that's not biblical at all. So we need sound biblical understanding of the times and the seasons that we're living in so that we can point people back to Jesus. I've heard it said before, we want to have... Uh, steady hands and clear eyes, right? We want to be those that can point people back to Jesus who aren't afraid. When everything starts unfolding, we realize that with every seal he rips open, with every sound of the trumpet and every bowl poured out, we're one day closer, one event closer to Jesus coming back. So the end times are not something to be feared or else we push off the day of the Lord. But it's something with anticipation, with 
soberness and alertness, we watch, we pray, and we beckon the Lord to come back for a people who have made themselves ready. So I wanna encourage you, if that strikes a chord with you or something that you're interested in, just to raise your hand. We've got ushers that are gonna hand out cards and this is not signing your life away, but this is just saying as more information comes available in the days ahead, raise it high so they can see you. We've got ushers coming around with cards. I'll be in the concourse after the service. You can find me at the black table right in in front of the connect room and we'll just connect those cards in the coming weeks and months. We'll give you more information about the Maranatha School. Uh, But why don't you turn your attention to the screens for a video that's going to give you more of a taste of what it will be like. We are living in the days that Isaiah prophesied in chapter 60, where he said that great darkness would cover the earth. But the word of the Lord through the prophet was, arise and shine for your light has come. God gave me this vision to raise up end time messengers that would be blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we're learning as students are coming is that God is not only wanting messengers, he's wanting end time fathers and husbands, wives and mothers. What does it look like for God to sanctify us fully, our body, our soul, and our spirit? I want to help train and equip a group of end time messengers that have given themselves to working internally so that when God uses them externally, they can sustain the power and the glory that God is about to pour out. God is gathering messengers all over from the United States to be trained and equipped in the classroom, to get solid in the Word of God, to learn what it means to prophesy, to heal the sick, to preach the Word of God with power and authority. You might be one of the end time messengers. I believe God is calling you. It up. Hello. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> well, just, just to repeat myself, hi, my name is Asher. I'm one of the staff members here at Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. And um, I'm also a product of Maranatha School of Ministry. My wife and I uh, went there um, for the 18-month program. And I really just want to encourage anyone that's like really just feeling the stirring from the Lord to really attend that school. Um, I would just like to say it is a life-changing experience. And if you're even just thinking about it, praying about it, I really, really would highly, highly encourage that you go to Maranatha School of Ministry because it really will be a life-changing experience. Well, tonight I have the honor to uh, take up the offering. Amen. Who's excited to give? Amen. Amen. I'd just like to ask, um, if you have come to the altar from, you know, a church other than the refuge, please lift your hand. Wow. Come on. If we could just welcome everybody that's here. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you could tell, like, just, you know, the body of Christ just uniting together as one together. It's not about, you know, it's not about this church or that church. It's not about a personality. It's not about um, status or anything like that. It's all about the man Christ Jesus. And that's really, what, that's really what it's all about, that the bride of Christ would be prepared to meet the bridegroom. So I just want to invite the ushers down uh, to give. I just have a few instructions to give you, and then I'm going to read just a short passage. So some ways that you can give, there's some tied envelopes in the, in the seat back pockets in front of you. You can give by cash, check, or card. Um, if you're writing a check, please make it payable to Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. Um, if you're here um, in the building or if you're watching online, we just want to welcome our, just our online audience from across the nation and across the nations of the earth. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. But if you want to give online, you can also do that. You can go to www.jeremiahjohnson.tv forward slash give. And then also we have a text to give option, which I uh, believe they're going to throw up on the screen. Um, The number to text to give is 704 
387-3893. Again, uh, if you're here, you want to uh, text to give, it's the number is 704-387-3893. I just want to read just a short passage before uh, we honor the Lord with our giving. It's out of Matthew 26, uh, starting in verse 6. It says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial, a very expensive perfume, and she poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you bothering the woman? For she has done a good deed for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured the perfume on my body, she did it in, to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, Wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. And I just give a little bit of context to this passage. You know, back in uh, those days, the custom of the time was whenever a young woman was preparing the time for marriage to get married, her family would go and buy an alabaster box and also an ointment to uh, put in the vial. And really what that represented was how, you know, beautiful the box was, um, how um, incredible, you know, or expensive the ointment was, really just displayed the amount of wealth that the family had. And what would happen is if a man came to the family and said, I want to marry your daughter, what the woman would do, the young woman would do, she would take the box and she would break it at her future husband's feet. And what that signified was that that was an extravagant act of honor in that culture. Is, does anyone, is anyone following what I'm saying? It was such an extravagant act of honor. Now, when Mary of Bethany did this, she was not doing it to say, hey, Jesus, I'm, I want to be married to you in that sense. But what she was doing is that she was giving an act of such extravagant honor and worship and devotion to Jesus. Yes, she was per helping prepare his body for burial, but it was just such an extravagant act of worship and honor that she was giving to Jesus. And I really just want to encourage you tonight. You might be here, and we can just learn from the story of uh, Mary that what she did is when she gave to the Lord, she gave her very best. Amen? You know, what a, what a young woman would do, it didn't matter how rich or poor they were, it, it, that really would just depend on what kind of box, it, alabaster box it was, what kind of ointment it was, but for them, it was the best that they could do. Amen? So I really just want to encourage you tonight. Um, I just really want, want you to just ask the Holy Spirit, what would he want you to give tonight? Because really what he's after, he's after your heart. Amen. He's, he's just after your heart. That's all he wants is he wants your heart. So I really just want to encourage you tonight that you would just come and seek and ask the Lord what he would want you to give. I want to just encourage you. You're not giving to a need tonight per se. You're giving into a vision that God has for the Charlotte region. Amen. Again, this is not, this is not about a personality. This isn't even about a ministry. It's all about the bride being prepared to meet the bridegroom. That's what it's all about. So I really just want to encourage you, again, just to ask the Lord, what would he have you to sow? And I really want to encourage you. You might be here. This is the, this is the first altar gathering we're ever, do, we're ever doing. Praise the Lord. Our ministry relocated from Florida up to North Carolina, and this was a huge reason why. Because the Lord said specifically to Jeremiah, build an altar for me in the Queen City that the Queen would be prepared to marry the King. And I just want to encourage you that this doesn't just stop with us. This is a generational thing. This is going to go for, for years and years to come. So when you sow tonight, you're not sowing just in, into tonight. You're really sowing into the destiny that God has for this city and what he has for this region. Because I'll tell you that there is a remnant bride that's arising in Charlotte, North Carolina, that's going to make straight the way of the Lord, that's going to help prepare the way for the, for the coming of the King. So, amen. I'm, I'm going to stop preaching, but I just really want to encourage. <laughs> I really just want to encourage you. You're sowing into destiny. You're sowing into purpose. You're sowing into the transformation of a city. Amen. So, I just want to ask you if you would just uh, lift up your your offering before the Lord tonight. I know my wife and I had even had spoken before the service started that we're gonna 
we ourselves are going to sow something sacrificially because we believe in what the altar stands for. We believe what God wants to do in the city. We're going to partner with him tonight. Amen. So just lift up your gift before the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Jesus, Lord, for who you are. We just thank you that there is a bride that is coming to make herself ready, Father. We just thank you, Lord, for each and every person, Lord, that's gathered in this place, Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that you see every need. Lord, so I just pray, Lord, for those, Lord, that have financial lack. We just thank you, Lord, as they trust you in this moment, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for the provision of heaven. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you would open, Lord, the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing, Lord, that they would not be able to contain it, Father. And Lord, we just declare, Lord, that tonight, Lord, we are sowing into the destiny, Lord, of what you have, Lord, for this region. Lord, we just thank you that Charlotte is primed for revival, Lord. We just prophesy, Lord, that Charlotte is primed for awakening in Jesus' mighty name. So we just thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing and what you're going to do. So, Father, we are excited for what you're going to do tonight, and we're excited for the days ahead. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If the ushers can go ahead, you can worship the Lord with your giving. God bless you. And please turn your attention to the screens for a short video. I am so excited about the awakening that's coming to planet Earth. I see an end time army arising. I see a bride, a glorious and spotless bride. I see messengers, apostolic and prophetic messengers. He's calling forth an army, a bride, a remnant. Are you in? Hallelujah! Is this on? Am I on? I'm not on. I'm really loud though, so this isn't working. Hello, okay, now I'm on. Hallelujah! How's everybody doing tonight? Come on, who was excited about what God was doing during worship? Can we just give the worship team a round of applause? I even wanna honor the pastors of the refuge, pastors Jay and Melanie Stewart. We're just so grateful that you guys opened up your house to us. We're so grateful that you guys chose to spend your Friday evening with us. You could be anywhere else in the world, but you chose to be here. You chose to partner with what God is doing in this region, and I'm excited about this. Even as Skylar was casting vision, as um, Asher was casting vision and even what I want to also add something that burns on the inside of me is to see the bride of Christ come together in unity with one another amen with all the things that are going on right now with everything that's happening with the pandemic with COVID-19 with the division that's even happening in the church guys this right now we're stomping on the plans of the enemy right we're stomping on the plans of the enemy because we're gathering here for one mission one vision and that is to exalt the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. I want to share with you guys. My name is Claudia. Just to introduce myself. I'm with the JJM team. It's such a privilege to be a part of this family and what God is doing in the earth through Jeremiah Johnson. Um, and I'm here just to tell you guys a little bit about some kingdom resources that we have available for you guys. And not only do I want to tell you that they're just available out in the lobby, I want to personally share some things that have impacted my life, my walk with the Lord. Is that okay? Do you guys have a couple minutes for me to just be transparent with you? Is that all right? All right. Okay. So I want to share one of these things. Not that this shirt necessarily impacted my life, but it has been used as an evangelism tool and I love it. We've stuck with this shirt. If you like to rock some t-shirts, if you like to rock some apparel, I have heard so many testimonies of people that are like, I've gotten stopped at the grocery store and like, what does prophesied dry bones to life mean? And that sparks conversation. You can share Jesus with somebody right there where you're at. So go ahead and get a t-shirt outside. A couple other books I wanted to recommend. Oh my goodness. Y'all, I have wept through some of these books. Not because, I even want to just say this, it's not because it's books, because we can just fill ourselves and fill ourselves and fill ourselves with resources. But if it doesn't fuel us into the place of prayer, if it doesn't bring us into the word of God, then it really means nothing. We're just getting ourselves spiritually fat, right? But these books, I'm telling you, they've impacted me, they've provoked me, they've convicted me to my core. So I just want to share a couple of those. This is actually my first book that I read by Jeremiah, and it's Cleansing and Igniting the Prophetic 
prophetic and urgent wake up call. And I'm just going to be honest. I almost didn't pick this book up and read it because I'm like, well, I'm not a prophet. I'm not going to read it. But I picked it up and I could not put it down. I was highlighting throughout the whole thing. There's so many scriptures. There's so much of an emphasis on the word of God being partnered with the spirit of God. And that the encouragement is if you can pray, you can prophesy. Amen. Amen. So one of the things that really impacted me too about this book, I'm about to hit this podium. I'm sorry, y'all. So one of the things that impacted me about this book was the last chapter where he talks about prophets and the fivefold ministry and the unity within all the fivefold ministry, how the prophets can partner with the pastors, how pastors can partner with evangelists, how every joint supplies. Amen. Another another book I wanted to recommend, this is a bestseller, Judgment on the House of God, Cleansing and Glory Are Coming. This is a powerful, powerful book, especially right now. I believe it's a now word for the church. I believe everybody needs to read this book right now. And I promise you, it will fuel you in the place of prayer because it's a book, when you think of judgment, you think of a negative connotation, right? But it's a judgment, the, the cleansing of God, God cleansing us from the inside out. And I believe that in order for us to see corporate revival, we need to see personal revival in our hearts. We need to come to a place in the secret places, in the bed chambers, where we're saying, God, I want clean hands and a pure heart. Amen. All right. The last thing I'm going to recommend, and this is my ultimate favorite, the power of consecration. And I said this one last because it is a central theme to the altar. And with the vision it is that we're casting here about the bride meeting the bridegroom, King Jesus. And the power of consecration, I read this book twice. And I'm telling you, it challenged me to my core in a season where the Lord was asking of me. Where the Lord, don't, don't you enter into those seasons sometimes where the Lord is like, I want that. I want that. I want that thing that you hold near and dear to your heart, that thing that's fascinating you, that thing that's stealing your attention. And I began to read this book in a season that the Lord was literally gripping my heart, just saying, I want you, Claudia. I want your attention. I want your gaze. I want you to be fascinated with me. And so when I was reading it, I remember I was in chapter three where Jeremiah starts describing the the consecrated bride. Who is this consecrated bride? What is the power of consecration? What does consecration mean? And he began to cast a vision about what it means to be affection based, to to allow your obedience to not be fueled from a place of obligation, but that my obedience is fueled by love sickness. Because when I look at the gaze of God, when I, when I check out from all the things that capture my attention and I say, I'm going to put myself in a posture and say, God, I'm looking at you. I'm going to consecrate myself to you. It no longer becomes from legalism. It no longer becomes from obligation. It becomes a thing where it becomes a reality where God, I'm so in love with you. How can I not give all my life? How can I not surrender everything? And that, my friends, is the power of consecration. It is fueled from a place of revelation, and it leads to obedience that's fueled from affection and love sickness. Amen? I want to read just one thing from this book before I welcome up Jeremiah, just to just to sort of continue to get us prepared. I don't want us to, I know during announcements, it's very easy to kind of get disengaged, but as we transition, as I call Jeremiah up for the message and as we prepare our hearts, I really want us to tune into what is what what this word is in this book that I'm going to read in just a moment. All right, I need to catch my breath a little bit. I get a little too excited, y'all. <laughs> I love y'all. This is awesome. A consecrated bride is beginning to emerge out of the present darkness covering the earth. She is rising still. Many of these sons and daughters are invisible now, but they will be invincible in the days ahead. Clothed with the radiant light of God. As darkness increases in the nations of the earth, the consecrated bride will receive Isaiah's words that now is the time for her to arise and shine. The consecrated bride recognizes that the darkest hours, my friends, are before the dawn. The increase of evil does not discourage her. It does not make her fearful. Is the world's darkness strong? I think we can all say yes. But that is not the question facing the bride. The question the church must ask and commit herself to answer is this. How strong and how bright is the light that is coming? Amen. Let's welcome up Jeremiah. Good evening. I 
wanted to honor Pastor Jay and Melanie Stewart for opening up their church to us. Can we give Pastor Jay and Melanie a round of applause? Thank you so much. We honor you. For those of you who are not familiar with myself, my beautiful wife is Morgan. Can you stand? Can we just honor Morgan real quick? We graduated from Southeastern University in 2010. I know Jay is a graduate as well. And after graduation, God called us to plant a church called Heart of the Father Ministry. And we were there in Lakeland for a decade and God uh, just moved powerfully in our midst. We became two campuses and around 2018, God began to visit me and he began to talk to me about the need to prepare a bride in the earth for her bridegroom, that there was an eternal storyline that he wanted to catch this generation up in and that he was asking me to be a part of that. And so I began to receive prophetic words about Charlotte and to be honest with you, I wasn't hearing it. I know there's some teaching out there that every prophetic word you receive should confirm something already in your spirit. That's never worked for me. Actually, I have been divinely directed by prophetic words that were never on my radar. And trying to teach people how to hear the voice of God over the years, my short and strongest advice is just listen for the voice that tells you what you don't want to do. And so we began to pray and fast and it was confirmed again and again, move to Charlotte. And so we began a season of transition with friends and family that we had built and done life with. Quite frankly, we were very comfortable in Florida. And we have moved up here in 2020 last year and brought some of our team. God has made it clear we're no longer to pastor again. God has called us to build an altar in the Charlotte region to help marry the queen, Charlotte, to the king. And so we want to come here to be a uh, a blessing. We want to be servants to the body all over Charlotte. And the Lord began to talk to me about building an altar. Many of the team has mentioned, and it's a wedding altar. You can see behind me. And God said that he is going to prepare a bride in Charlotte to meet her bridegroom king. And so we're hosting these monthly gatherings, all the songs, all the messages, all the prayers are directed into this central theme. Now, if you follow me around the nation, this will take great discipline for me. Because if you hear me preach and teach other places, it's dreams and visions and fire. People are falling down and I love to flow like that. But I believe there's a very specific assignment that God has for this region. And quite frankly, I'm here to do it until I die. Where we're coming from is we didn't leave everything that we loved, everything that we were invested in for nothing. We're here for the long haul. So thank you for receiving us. Thank you for coming. I see several pastors and leaders in the area. We welcome you. For those who who drove in, who's not from North Carolina, wave at us. Look at all this. Let's welcome all these folks who drove in from... In fact, will you stand? Will you stand if you drove in from another state? Just stand real quick. Come on, welcome these folks here. Thank you. I'm going to be sharing a message tonight called the return of our bridegroom king. I want to lay some foundation for where we're headed in the next several months. 
I want to introduce a biblical concept to you. I hope by the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, that our thinking can be shaped, that our hearts can be prepared for the days ahead. There are many revelations of who God is in the Scriptures. He's our Maker, He's our Creator, He's our Father, but God is our Bridegroom. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, I ask over the next several moments that you would mark us with eternity, O oh God. Lord, I lift up the Charlotte region to you. Lord, I lift up the surrounding cities. And God, we ask, would you help us make a way for your Son? God, we ask that all mountains of pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency would be leveled before you. God, we're asking that valleys of discouragement and disappointment would be lifted up. God, we call forth the messengers in Charlotte. God, we thank you that you're preparing voices in the wilderness to herald the return of your Son. God, we lift up our gaze in this generation. Jesus, we exalt you. We say that there is none like you. God, we thank you that you are seated far above every principality and power. And God, we ask, would you come and rule and reign in Charlotte? God, would you come and rule and reign on the seats of our hearts. I want to ask you to maybe do something out of your comfort zone, but if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues, would you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit right now? If you have not been, just pray in English. But I just want to stir up an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we we welcome you here. Holy Spirit, we ask for a fresh baptism of fire. God, come and cut through the haze. God, come and confront vain imaginations concerning who you are. God, we ask that you would flood this atmosphere with light. Come on, just 30 more seconds. Boraba shokora masia Holy Spirit, come with power. Holy Spirit, come and exalt Jesus. Release the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Release fire on your word tonight. Come and mark us, we pray. Come on, there's more, there's more, there's more. There's an eternal cry in your heart. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. We repent of moving on. We repent of shutting you down. God, would you come and dwell in our midst tonight. Come and sit among your people, we pray. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. You're in charge and we're not. You're in charge and we're not. God, we don't live above your word. We live underneath your word. God, you're the potter and we're the clay. Come and mold us and shape us. Come and shift us and shake us. Lord, release the spirit of awakening here, we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 Come on, don't get quiet on me. Don't get quiet on me. Don't get quiet on me. Hallelujah. I want to introduce this concept of God as the bridegroom. I feel very proud of myself because I have prepared a slideshow for you. 
And in 12 years of preaching, I've done two slideshows. So you've got to know I am radically committed to introducing some of these themes according to the Word of God to you. We're going to make the notes available through email. You can write them on your phone. But I want to take this first altar just to build some foundation, to teach some concepts, to ask God to enlighten the eyes of our heart that we might know him better. What I want to say starting out is this. Our lifestyle, the way that we choose to live our lives, is a direct re reflection of our revelation of who God is. Our lifestyle and the way that we choose to operate our lives is a direct reflection of our revelation of God. This is why A.W. Tozer said, the most important thing about you is who do you say that God is? The most important thing about you tonight that will set the trajectory of your life, the very decisions that you make, all gets traced back to who is God to you. If you look at a generation caught in sin, if you look at a generation straying from the Lord, don't get caught up in the fruit of disobedience go back to the root of who is God to them. So God reveals himself in the Old Testament as a bridegroom husband. You can throw that uh, screen on the, the uh, slide on the screen. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself as a bridegroom husband. Let me read you a couple of scriptures. Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. Let me read you Hosea 2 verse 16. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord." Only the language of betrothal expresses the intensity of the affection that God has for us. Only the language of betrothal expresses the intensity of the affection that God has for us. I want you to know that there's a man on the throne. His name is Jesus, and he has fire in his eyes. He's not your homeboy. God is not your sugar daddy. He's not looking the other way when you choose to look and act ways that are contrary to the Scriptures. A lot of times we like to think of God in terms that let us off the hook concerning our lifestyle. But how many husbands know in here that you would be kind of upset, that I would dare say you would be really upset if you knew that your wife, the one that you were betrothed to, was in bed with other lovers. If you were on date night and she was staring off into outer space, if it was 
time to spend one-on-one time and there was distraction. So as we come into a knowledge that God is a bridegroom God, that He is a husband, that He has made covenant with us, that He will remove everything that stands in the way of love. God loves you too much to leave you the way that he finds you. What the seeker-friendly church got right is, come as you are. But where they failed is this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so transformational that come as you are does not mean stay as you are. There's no way that you've encountered the affection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way that you've experienced experience inward transformation that you can walk in one way and still walk out the same. Anybody tracking with me tonight? I'm talking about Jesus Christ as our bridegroom. I'm talking about the jealous covenantal love that will track us down into very distant days. I'm talking about a love of God that says you can run, but you can't hide. How many of us in here are grateful? You're thankful for the love of God that delivered you, that set you free, that broke the power of the sin nature off of your life, that delivered you from a life of shame and fornication. I want to declare to you tonight the goodness of our God, that His mercy endures forever, that His forgiveness is as far as the east is to the west. I wish I didn't have have to preach tonight. I believe that there's a remnant that God is raising up in Charlotte that is going to give the Lamb of God the full reward of his suffering. That's going to lock eyes with the Son of Man and say, Jesus, you are beautiful. Jesus, you are the pearl of great prize. Lord, I need an encounter. I need a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Lord, I'm tired of three songs and a nice message. Lord, I need the fire of intimacy in my devotional life. If you're breathing tonight, say amen. Amen. There's a beautiful, glorious Son of Man who came, who died, and who rose again. And in the same way He went up, He said, I'm coming down. Hallelujah. Would you just close your eyes with me? And let's just pray a biblical prayer. Ephesians 1.17. God, we're asking for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who you are. Lord, break the scales. Rip off the blinders. Rip the feeding tubes out of pulpits. Lord, we want to eat on you, God. We want to be like blind Bartimaeus, son of David. Have mercy. God, have mercy on Charlotte. Have mercy on this generation. Lord, we dig deep tonight. Lord, spirit of awakening, would you come? Spirit of prayer, would you come? The Lord is saying to many of you, I'm about to dust you off. I'm about to refire you in this season. I'm not just going to dust you off. I'm going to set your feet upon the rock of Jesus Christ. I'm going to raise up the burn stones in Charlotte. I'm going to pick my people back up in set them on fire. Lord, we're asking in Jesus' name, open up our eyes, God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see you. Isaiah 62, 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. How many of you know that as God's kids, He's rejoicing over us tonight? Our weak attempts move His heart. 
our desire to be introduced into a new revelation of who he is. It deeply moves him. Jeremiah 3.14, return, O backslidden children, for I am married to you. He loves you. He loves you. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what your 2020 was like. Doesn't matter what you're hiding. There's a covenant keeping Hased love of God that's going to overtake this generation. One glimpse of Him changes everything. One glimpse of Him turns Saul into Paul. One radical encounter with God is going to flip this generation upside down. Come on, I believe in the unlimited wonder-working power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that no one is safe from His love. That I don't have to apologize about being unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The covenant between God and man is not a service agreement. It's a marriage union. The covenant between God and man is not a service agreement. In the words of Mike Bickle, God doesn't need more workers. He's looking for more lovers. Oh, I just encourage you, if you feel like you don't fast enough, you don't pray enough, you don't give enough, can I encourage you, all of that is sustained through a love encounter with Jesus. If you have in your Bibles, would you turn to Matthew 9? I want to jump into a direct passage where Jesus actually introduces himself as the bridegroom. We took a couple of minutes in the Old Testament to just have a frame of reference for God saying, I'm your husband, I'm your bridegroom, I'm jealous for you, I'm not going to settle for for Sunday morning and 15 bucks and an offering. Jesus Christ isn't a crisis ATM. He's not a salt and pepper shaker that adds flavor to your life. He is the life. He is the way. He is the truth. Jesus is not an item on the buffet where we have a little of the world and a little of Jesus. How many of you know you can get so full of Jesus that what once enticed you now disgusts you? Come on, I'm looking for someone to testify of the love of God, of His mercy, of His graciousness. Come on, let's return to the joy of our salvation. Let's leave frozen chosen assembly with Pastor Frigid Air. Come on, let's get filled with the Holy Ghost. Let's get excited about being born again. Let's see the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever known. Let's see them come into the kingdom of God. Let's lift our gaze beyond temporary situations. Let's stop being disappointed about who's in the Oval Office because my God sits above the circle of the earth and there has never been a transition of power in the history of the world because our God is Yahweh. He is is mighty. He is the Lord strong and mighty. He will fight our battles. He will come like a two double edged sword in this generation. And he will come and cut through our boredom, all our excuses. And he will capture our heart once again. I feel like I'm trying to preach you into what God has for you in 2021. Come on, God isn't boring. We are. Come on, we can't get people saved because they're looking at us. Come on, many of us, you serve the devil way better than you've ever served God. 
out at the club till three and church has to be an hour. Remember I said he loves you? He loves you enough to tell you the truth. I'm talking about the God of the Bible and not the God of our imagination. I'm talking about the throne room, not a TED talk. I'm not talking about the best version of you. The best version of me and you is dead. TED is dead. We don't need any more self-help gospel. Three steps to a better life. Five steps to a better marriage. We need a radical encounter with the Son of Man. We need Him breaking forth in darkness. We need Him wounding us for a greater cause than just ourselves. Matthew chapter 9. Let's watch Jesus here in verse 14. Then the disciples of John, being John the Baptist, came to him, being Jesus, saying, Matthew 9, 14, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, I'd encourage you to underline this verse, The attendance of the bridegroom, referring to himself, cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So the disciples of John are fasting, they're sacrificing, they're still waiting for the first coming of Messiah. And Jesus Christ is walking the earth, and his disciples aren't fasting. And Jesus' response to them, I'll give you my rendition, is basically this. While I'm here on the earth right now in this story, it is such a glorious, exciting time in the earth that there's no reason to fast. But a day will come when I leave. He's prophesying and predicting his crucifixion and his resurrection. You don't need to fast now because times are so glorious. But one day the bridegroom is going to leave and then they will fast. Have you ever heard people try to tell you that fasting is not New Testament? When Jesus is clearly prophesying that when he leaves planet earth, then it will be time to fast. That in the first chapters of Matthew, it's not when you feel like it or if you feel like it, but when you fast. In this moment, I, I actually believe that Jesus is revealing his personal leadership strategy. I believe that Jesus' leadership strategy while he walked the earth was he established a team of disciples who were pierced, struck, fascinated, and in love with him. After he dies and rises from the dead, they willingly labor to establish his kingdom even to the point of martyrdom. What I'm describing is called love sickness, not religious obligation. These disciples encountered, they were struck, they were pierced in such a way that they didn't even fear death. When the honest truth is some have encountered Jesus so little that they can't even wake up for church on Sunday. These disciples that walked with Jesus were so radically encountered. Have you ever read this and thought, I need to know this love? 
I need to encounter an affection that moves me beyond I'm not feeling it. I need to experience a, a tangible encounter with the Lord that delivers me from going through the motions, singing songs, quoting scriptures out of my head, and lacking a heart on fire for Him. Lord, I want to know this love. Song of Solomon 8.6 he got it. There is a love stronger than death. What would it get to take you to the place that someone walks in here with a gun and puts it to your head and says, deny Christ or I'll shoot you dead? What would it take to get every one of us to the place where we're so in love with Him, so fixed on eternity, we without hesitation say, pull the trigger? See, Jesus Christ isn't returning to mess up your party. He's coming to start it. Just bow your heads with me one, one moment. Lord, Your Word says in the book of Romans that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that You would fill up love tanks in here. Lord, for those of us running on empty, for those of us going through the motions, for those of us depressed and weary, God, fill us up. Lord, I'm not only asking for an inflowing, Lord, I pray for an overflow. Lord, let your love compel us. Come on, if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, just pray again. We're fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. We're communing with Him. We love You, Lord. We're not okay with the duty. We're not okay with the lethargy and the complacency. We're not okay with the Bible reading plan that's stale and dry. Lord, release fire tonight. Fiery, romantic love. Lord, we pray for love encounters all over this room. Lord, flood Charlotte with your love. The power of the gospel. It is good news. Come on, 30 more seconds. You're not doing it for me. You're doing it for him. <sighs> fire, fire, fire. The fire of romance. The fragrance of his presence. There is more. Come on, Jesus already paid for it. Lord, everything that you died for, everything that you rose again for, Lord, release it in my life. There is a love stronger than death. Lord, I want to know it. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, there's more. There's more than church attendance. There's more than a nine to five. There's more than holding on till Corona's gone. There is a love stronger than death. I believe the apostles in the first century church spoke with great affection of the second coming of Jesus Christ. I believe their passion, their desire, and their sacrifice was fueled for their longing to see their friend and bridegroom Jesus again. I want to look at some specific examples in the New Testament just to connect the dots with you. 
Jesus came and introduced himself as the bridegroom in the New Testament. He said a day would come when he would leave, and then the friends of the bridegroom would begin to yearn and long for him once again. He wounded, he pierced, he radically changed his disciples' lives. And as the New Testament church in the book of Acts is birthed, what I want us to understand tonight is that his return was at the forefront of all their labor. Let me show you a couple of scriptures, okay? Let's look at Acts 3.19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come in the presence of the Lord. How many of you ever have ever heard that? But what you see underlined up there, I've actually never heard preached with what I just said. All I've ever heard is repent so that you can be refreshed. Peter stands up in Acts chapter 3, he releases a message of repentance. He says refreshing will come, but where's his heart at? That he, they, he missed Jesus. Like, like, like there, there was a longing, there was a connection, there, there was a intimacy. How, how many of you married and actually in love, hallelujah, miss your spouse when they're gone? See, the thing I've realized about talking about the bridal revival is it comes after marriages and families. But we'll get there in the months ahead that he may send Jesus Christ. Here's what I want us to understand. The present message of repentance was connected to the future return of Jesus Christ. The present message of repentance was directly connected to the future return of Jesus Christ. Let's go to 1 Peter 1, 6 through 8. It should be on the screen. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. Rejoicing in present trials was connected to the return of Jesus Christ. I have never in my life ever heard a message encouraging saints to get through trials connected to the return of Christ. Not one time. Grew up a pastor's son pastored myself, traveled all over the world, yet in the New Testament, they preached the message of repentance connected to the return of Jesus. They encouraged and challenged people struggling under trial. Remember, the Lord Jesus is coming. Titus 2, 11. Don't you love the Bible? Don't you just love that it's all in there? Titus 2, 11, For by the grace of God it brings salvation. It's appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should le live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. I'm going to tell you this is another one I've heard preached and they never get to the underline. 
It's all about get right with God. It's all about live godly. you got to get sober. But the writer Peter is connecting to looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul called the second coming of Jesus Christ the church's blessed hope. The call to holy living is directly connected to the return of Jesus Christ. I hope as we're winding down tonight, you're asking questions like, why in the last a thousand sermons I've heard, hardly any of them have been about the return of Christ? For me, what I've found is most of the time it's saints about 50 and 60 years old and over that will tell you they grew up with this kind of preaching and teaching. They remember messages and sermons on the return of Jesus Christ and the need to get ready at any moment. I'm going to prophesy to you out of the word of God, God is about to revive in this generation and at this time he's going to begin to trumpet once again the return of Jesus Christ. He's going to catch a people up into an eternal storyline that even supersedes revival. Now I'm really going to mess with us. I'm actually going to tell you, according to the Word of God, that there is even a greater cry for revival. Now, this is like... Um, heresy in the charismatic movement because our entire focus is Lord send revival. Now to some people that means extended meetings. To some people it's a time of refreshing. But I want to tell you there's an ache. There's a longing deep down on the inside of you. And it's actually for your resurrected body. Show me. I'd love to. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. I want you to know that if you are born again, there is imperishable seed that's on the inside of you. And he has marked us for eternity. And there is an eternal cry locked up on the inside side of you and here it is come Lord Jesus I'm happy for the lack of response because I hope your mind is blown I hope that there's a paradigm being released by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that you got born again for more than finding a nice church, getting married, and playing house. You were born for more than the American dream. It's called the God dream. There's a God-sized dream that He wants to invite this generation in and I'm prophesying to you that there are thousands and thousands of individuals who have tried church but they've never tried Jesus. We have people burned out and they're burned out on programs because they've never been introduced to the Son of Man. Oh! 
We are the dwelling place of God. We should all be shocked that we haven't blown up yet. The eternal God has chosen to take up residence on the inside of us. When we were born again, he wove into our new nature an ache and a longing that will not be satisfied until we meet him face to face. Oh, hallelujah. So revival, yes, but it's just a foretaste of what's coming. Oh, oh, I, I, I hope I'm reaching out to someone bored with church, disillusioned with COVID, troubled over the political scene in America. I hope God is beginning to percolate. He's beginning to populate. He's beginning to do something on the inside of you that says, wait a minute, there is more. There is more than a career. There is more than a nice church service. I was born for eternity. There's pleasures forevermore in the presence of God. Second Timothy 4a, we're just reading the Bible tonight. Praise God. Second Timothy 4:8, Paul's at the end of his life. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me also, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Do you know that there's an actual reward in heaven for those who love his appearing? But folks, the fact that we're not looking forward to his appearing is a revelation of how carnal we are. The fact that there's not a fiery romance on the inside of us is test positive that we have believed a self-help gospel that quite frankly has wiped out a large portion of the New Testament. One of the questions I want to leave us with as we're winding down if longing for the appearing of Christ was normative in the first century church, then what keeps believers from longing for His return and studying the Scriptures concerning it? Again, I want you to picture a first century church who was absolutely fascinated, longing, and love. They connected so many of their messages back to the return of Jesus. If it was so with them and it's not with us, why is that? Let me give you three points quickly. Number one, misconception. This misconception says studying the end times will distract us from fulfilling the Great Commission. I actually want to tell you that a correct view of the end times will always lead to a passion for the harvest. Folks, it's because he's returning that he wants to release the urgency of the hour that it's not okay that people are going to die and go to hell in Charlotte. It's, it's because there's a judgment day. It's because every man will have to give an account for his life that God wants to stir up that eternal cry in your heart where you not only declare his first coming, but you declare his second coming. Number two, deception. So we have misconception and then we have deception. Number two, this says Jesus told us not to be overly concerned with the end times. 
Here's a verse that people will quote, Matthew 24. But on that day, no one knows the hour, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. So they take this scripture and say, you know what, brother? You really, you get excited about the end times. You get excited about his return, but it'll all pan out. They're not pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. They're pan-trib. You ever heard these people? It'll all pan out. But my question is, will it pan out for your family? Will it pan out for your friends? But here's where the deception is. The very verses that Jesus is using to try to get us to be watchful and on alert is the very verses they're trying to use to make you passive and indifferent. No one knows the hour or the day, therefore be on the alert. Therefore, wake up, stir yourself up in your most holy faith rather than, well, it doesn't matter. No one really knows. I'll just eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow I'll die. Whatever. Deception. Number three, accusation. This worldly spirit mocks the return of Jesus Christ. Could I have the band come up? 2 Peter 3, 1 through 4, Beloved, I now write to you that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming. I believe that God wants to break a spirit of accusation off of your life. I believe as I've prayed and fasted for our time tonight, I'm certain that there is a liar, that there is a deceiver, that there is a spirit of the age that has come to whisper to the saints in America, he's not really coming back. They've always believed that. Where is he? What would it take to break ties with that tonight? Another way of saying it would be, would your life look any different if you were certain he was coming tomorrow night? What if tomorrow night at nine o'clock, the sky split? I mean, my, my mind is flashing with hundreds of people that I know that will spend eternity in hell. My mind is flashing to many people who attend church every Sunday and all they believe in is behavior modification. They're not really saved and think they are. Wayne Grudem, he's a scholar. He wrote a book called Systematic Theology. He made an incredible statement. He said, the degree to which we long for Christ's return is a measure of our spiritual condition now. I want you to close your eyes with me. I believe that there's an invitation from heaven to the Charlotte region, Kannapolis, Concord, Matthews, Salisbury. I mean, the, Revelation 22 7, the Spirit and the bride say come i want you to know the holy spirit who lives on the inside of you he's saying come 
will you agree with him tonight? I believe that there are messengers here, gospel preachers, that are willing to embrace the pain of it's not okay where I'm at with God tonight. God, come and mark Charlotte with eternity. Come and build an altar in this region that would prepare the bride to meet the bridegroom. If you have a prayer language, just one last time tonight, would you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit? If you do not have a prayer language, just pray in English. There's an eternal cry on the inside of you tonight. There's a deeper longing than even revival. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's stand all over this place and just lift up our hands to the Lord. Keep praying. There's an altar that's open down here tonight. I believe that there are many in here that God wants to mark for eternity. That you feel fire on the inside of you tonight. You know there's more. If that's you, I want you to make your way down to the front right now quickly. You know that God wants to mark you for eternity. You say, you know what? I'm not giving over to his return. I'm not burdened enough. I'm not gripped enough with this message of his second coming. God, I need you to fill my life with your love. God, I need you to touch me like you did all those years ago. Would you come? Come down to this altar. There's more. There's more. There's more. I'm telling you there's more than the temporary. There's more than church attendance. There's more than revival. There's one coming on the clouds, dressed in white. Come, Lord Jesus. Just lift up your voices all over the auditorium. Sing in the Spirit. Open up your mouth. Come on, I'm telling you, there's an eternal cry if you're born again. It's already there. You don't even have to receive it. Come on, we're almost there. Let's break through the complacency and the apathy and the business as you. So much more, 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 so
right now. God, I release holy unrest. Lord, I'm asking for a contending spirit. Lord, that we will not settle for our friends dying and going to hell. Come on, I want you to pray. Lord, mark us tonight for the harvest. Lord, release an urgency of the hour. Lord, release tremors all throughout the earth. You can do it just two more minutes. You drove, you came, put in that supply. Groan if you have to groan. Cry if you have to cry. Laugh if you have to laugh. God, come and have your way. your hearts, Lord. In Holy Spirit, come. Spirit in the bright, say come. Say come. In Holy Spirit, come. Say come. We wait. In Holy Make us one God deliver us of inferior appetites as John G. Lake cried, Lord, release a God cry in this generation. Oh God, there's a deeper hunger. There's a greater appetite. God, I ask that you would release the gift of eternal hunger in this place. Ask him right now, God, release the gift of eternal hunger. Yeah. 
we love you Jesus many of you received communion when you came in some of you did not and it will be in the back I want to encourage you take this communion when you go home tonight before you go to bed when you take this communion say I do to the Lord I'm signing up again I'm committing 2021 to you covenant with you hitting delete on inferior appetites and saying God give me an eternal cry as we close tonight I want to ask you to help me pray that God would establish an altar in Charlotte I believe that tonight is the first of what he wants to do in a region and a territory that is something has been in his heart for ages if you're from the Charlotte region Kannapolis Concord if you're from the 50 mile radius would you just lift up your hand just pray a 30 second prayer with me God we're asking that you would build an altar where saints and leaders would lay down their need to compete and their need to boast about their church and how many and how much Lord we want a spirit of unity to blanket Charlotte Lord we want to rally around an eternal cry come Lord Jesus come on just 10 more seconds God build your altar get us ready for the wedding day get me ready for the wedding day I pray I'm going to let the band sing us out tonight. We love you. Thank you for coming. You can go and get your kids. But let's worship the Lord as we leave tonight. We'll